Welcome to Mayo Clinic Q&A. I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. We continue our coverage on COVID-19, and it's time for another check-in with Mayo Clinic infectious disease expert and vaccine expert, Dr. Greg Poland. Dr. Poland, thanks again for joining us. Yes, lots of new things happening. So I was going to say, it's the start of another week, and uh, what's, uh, what's new? Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion now about testing, the different types of testing that's going on. Uh, mm. Can you, can you explain? Explain the different types of tests so our listeners have a better understanding. Yeah, Sanj, this is a great question because the whole issue of testing um, presupposes every plan about not only how we close down, but how we reopen. So at this point, there are two types of tests. One is meant to be diagnostic. This is where a swab's put up the nose or in the throat and it, what's called a molecular test, an RT-PCR, is done to determine, are you right now uh, infected with the virus? Note that that doesn't work very early on in the infection. You have to wait a few days. The second type of test is a serological test. This is a test to determine, after you've recovered, was this um, COVID-19? In other words, do I now have antibodies against that virus. What we don't know, and this is really important, is what level of antibody is protective and for how long. If uh, I'm having symptoms, I should not be asking for a serological test. Is that correct? Correct, because it would likely be too soon. In other words, like all, like all uh, viruses, it will be somewhere in the 7, 10, 14 day time period, more towards the 14 before that test would actually turn positive and us know definitively. So why is it important to have the serological test to see if you have antibodies? What, what does that tell you? You've already had the, the disease, so what information does one glean from that? Yeah, really good question, because the most important thing will be up for us to figure out at what level of antibody do we think you are protected against reinfection or re-exposure, and as you might imagine, once we know that, particularly on the healthcare side, you can redeploy healthcare workers with presumably no fear of them getting infected with that virus, not needing uh, the same level of PPE and being able to care for people, even very sick people. Yeah, so you can see the importance of that. In addition, we've been reading about home testing kits. Mm. Can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the idea behind that would be to do what are called lateral flow or point of care assays. Um, and presumably they could be done at home. It depends on, on whether you're taking a sample or whether you're doing a, a blood test with a finger stick. And the latter will be the more common. And the idea, much like a pregnancy test, for example, or maybe a flu test, is that you could determine within five, 10, 15 minutes whether or not you had been infected. Now, one precaution in all the enthusiasm, and, and rightly so, because we need these tests, but one precaution is nobody has defined well what's called the operating characteristics of the assay. In other words, when you're positive, in other words, uh, if you're infected, what percent of the time does the test show that? When you are not infected, what percent of the time does the test show you as negative? And that really does need to be figure out, figured out. These are assays that have been granted emergency use authorization. So they haven't gone through the normal kinds of testing that would be true of a, of a test offered, say, at a, at a hospital or a clinic. So what, what would be your message then to somebody who's listening to this who feel that they have symptoms? Should they try this home testing? What, what would be your message to them? Yeah, I don't think the home testing is immediately available. And I think uh, the prudent thing to do would be to contact your physician and determine what uh, assays do they have available to them in the healthcare setting that they're in. Now, we're also seeing more and more people now, CDC recommendations are to wearing masks. Um, everybody should be wearing masks. What are your thoughts about that um, and also the impact of social distancing? Yeah, you know, the, the impact of social distancing, and I'll take that one first, uh, are real. Um, as people get isolated, uh, we tend to th see things like substance abuse, depression, 
eating disorders, anxiety, even suicide. And you know, you have to realize in the last 20 years, we've had a 35% increase in suicides in, in the US. And by the way, a goodly proportion of that in people in the healthcare setting. So, so this is really an, an important issue. My daughter, who's a mental health professional, calls it the second wave of the pandemic. Uh, so I think we're gonna have to attend to that and attend to that well. The issue about masking is an important one in terms of this whole concept of flattening down and elongating out this curve. And the idea there is in the medical setting that every healthcare provider and every patient would wear a mask. On the uh, public side of things, they are homemade masks, not medical masks. And you know that's another whole discussion, but Wearing masks uh, is, is important, I believe, and can be helpful. This is particularly true because uh, three new models have been released now, showing that, if you will, the danger cloud, let's call it, around somebody breathing, coughing, sneezing, is probably larger than the six-foot uh, rule that has been generally used and can extend out as far as 30 feet. So, Dr. Poland, we've talked about the different types of testing. Um, how, how will this allow us to reopen uh, moving forward? Yeah, great question. It definitely helps us reopen on the medical side. In other words, once we know what doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers uh, have in terms of an immunity status, we can redeploy them to see patients with a much lower level of PPE and presumably without risk. Other sectors of the, of the economy are the same thing. In fact, interestingly enough, people have been talking about, do we issue an immunity card or passport mm. so that if you're a school teacher and you have immunity, you can go back to teaching school. If you're a school kid, you can go back to school. And you can imagine that for every sector of the economy. In the private business sector, people who are immune could go back to work and you just keep broadening that out. Talking about the social distancing of six feet, mm. but you were mentioning that if somebody, for example, is symptomatic, six feet may not be enough. Can you just expand on that a little bit? Yeah, there have been three different models released since last uh, Friday, actually, showing one is, they're all computer simulations, by the mm -hmm. way, but showing, for example, in a grocery store, if somebody were to sneeze, that you are probably at risk for as much as 30 feet or more around that person for many minutes. They didn't specify how many. Another model showing that if you're outside, which is interesting, and you are behind somebody who is exhaling, sneezing, or coughing, let's say you're behind a runner or a bicyclist, you might have to be 30 or, or more feet away from that person in order to eliminate or at least dramatically reduce your risk of inhaling possible virus. And that's part of what's driving not only the social distancing, but the masking. I think uh, you can see uh, the weekends, it was nice weather, people walking outside and keeping their distance. But as you said, if you're behind a runner who sneezes, even you think six feet is, is far, you can see the need for wearing the mask. Thank you for explaining that to us. I was wondering if you could also explain to us, we're, we're hearing about flattening the curve. And so I think we all understand what that means. But now what we're hearing of words like the, the curve is elongating. Yeah. What does that mean? So the idea behind it is you have this peak in cases followed about uh, five to seven days later by a second peak in terms of uh, hospitalizations, critical care, and then a little bit later, a peak in deaths. So the idea is to flatten down those, and by doing that, you elongate that out. The idea go, it goes something like this. Let's say you're a, a, in a small community and you have a 200-bed hospital. Maybe they have five to 10 ICU beds. Maybe they have three to five ventilators, and they have a limited number of doctors and nurses, et cetera. If you admit two or three a week, you can probably care for those patients well, and they'll likely survive if they can survive that disease. But what happens when you admit 20 or 50 or 100? Well, now you don't have enough ventilators, you don't have enough specialists, you don't have enough medications, and the mortality rate goes up. 
So the trade-off here is to elongate out how long people might be getting sick, and by doing that, flattening those peaks that I mentioned so that you can care for each of those people, mm. those patients well, and increase their chances of survival. But in doing so, does that mean our time to reopen may be elongated itself? That's, that's the trade-off. I mean, fundamentally, uh, and I hate to put it this way, but fundamentally, this is going to be a decision between lives and dollars. Wow, that's a sobering thought to, to wow. hear. Uh, we've heard, also heard about different trials. We've heard about the plasma phoresis trial, but we've also heard some medications um, being started. Do you have any update on how those trials are going? Yeah, Sanj, very, very important question. Thank you for asking that. Um, three different trials uh, that have been, I should say, really more reports. One about plasma phoresis, which does appear to be beneficial. Clinical trials still have to be done, but early reports are of benefit. And uh, by the way, Mayo Clinic is the national coordinating center for that. The second has been a, a case report series on hydroxychloroquine. This does not seem to be offering any major benefit. The third one, which came out Friday in the New England Journal, was a, uh, a series of cases where the antiviral called remdesivir has been used. And in that study, about two thirds of them improved in terms of the level of oxygen support that they needed. In other words, maybe they went from the ventilator to using a mask, or if they were on a mask, to having nasal cannula uh, oxygen. 13% of them still died and 19% of them either worsened or had no benefit. So you're really still, in many ways, left with the decision, does this represent a clear and beneficial therapy? And I would say, no, we can't say that yet. What we can say is that this is an incrementally positive point on the line that's being drawn in terms of the journey of understanding what's going to work. This is, to me, motivation to continue mm -hmm a true clinical trial of remdesivir. So half the patients get remdesivir, half get usual care, and we find out, were the people who got better destined to get better anyway, or was it a result of remdesivir? How far are we from having those type of trials uh, being conducted and getting the results? So the trials are in progress. Uh, they've been done, uh, they're being initiated here in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, China also. So, you know, who knows, uh, weeks? we should probably start seeing those results. We'll take any positive news now because you were sharing yeah. with me about how COVID-19 is our, affecting our mortality statistics. Can you uh, just elaborate on that for yeah. our listeners? Yeah, it's, it's kind of shocking in a way to realize that COVID-19 is now the number eight cause of death in the U.S. And many of the causes in front of it are things like accidents or cancer or uh, heart disease. So you, you really realize how this is impacting mortality uh, in the U.S. Nothing like, at this point, like um, the 1918 influenza pandemic, which erased years of life off uh, the, the uh, longevity figures in the U.S., but still a very important cause of mm -hmm. death. Uh, on a lighter note, I think we do need some uh, levity. Uh, Dr. Fauci uh, was mentioning that perhaps the days of handshaking are, are over as we know it. What, what are your thoughts about that? Will, will we ever get to those sort of high five or some crazy handshakes? Yeah, you know, I think he's exactly right. About 20 years ago, I started talking about this uh, in, in lectures that I would give nationally and internationally. The whole idea of extending your right hand derives from uh, more medieval times when you showed that uh, by extending your right hand, you were not harboring a weapon. And that uh, extended from, uh, in fact, why the British drive on the left side, we might say the wrong side, <laughs> because the carriage or horse reins were in your left hand, leaving your sword hand free. So to extend your hand was to say, I come in peace, I, ha I harbor no weapon. But the reality of it is in modern day times, you may well be harboring a bioweapon, so to speak. So uh, I think there are much more 
uh, safe and culturally appropriate ways to indicate a greeting. The British have always been ahead of the curve. So now that I understand, they were always driving on the right side of the road. Um, anything else, uh, Dr. Poland, that you'd like to include that we didn't talk about? Um, I think one other thing on the medical side, which is uh, sort of astounding when you think about it. You know, it was a great thing when smallpox was eradicated as a scourge on, the, on human health. We are close to eradicating polio in the world. And it was announced uh, over the weekend that the Global Polio Eradication Initiative is going to have to be put on a hold mm -hmm. during this COVID-19 crisis. And, you know, while we're not talking about the same number of deaths with polio or anything like that, it makes you realize anew the gravity and the impact of COVID-19 on the world. But hopefully we get through this and we can launch back up, as you said, the great polio initiative. Our thanks, our thanks to Mayo Clinic infectious disease and vaccine expert, Dr. Greg Poland. As always, great information to help our listeners stay up to date with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, Greg. Good to be with you, Sanj. Take care. You too. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.